Stephen, 1951, Dallas, Texas. Yes. Let's go back to when you were just a little boy. What do you remember? Well, from uh, May 30th, 1951, I remember nothing. <laughs> that was the day I was born. Uh, it, one of the earliest memories I kind of have is that my grandfather on my mother's side, uh, Samuel Weinstein, passed away that same month. And that is kind of how I got my name Stephen, because his Hebrew name was uh, Shmuel, Samuel. And so I took the S and I became Schleim Hess, and I became Stephen Tobolowsky. And my cousin Sima, who we call Sima Bima, she lives in Houston. She was born at around the same time, and she got the familial S too and became Sima. So that's sort of the earliest uh, ideas I have about who I was. Now, your grandfather, they were in Pennsylvania, your grandparents? My mother's grandparents were there, and my dad's father and mother were here in Dallas. Okay. okay. What, what did your grandparents do? Oh, who knows? My grandfather, here in Dallas, my grandfather yelled at the television set. Uh, during he, wrestling? During wrestling. Uh, he was, he was convinced that there were crimes going on there, unreported to authorities, and we had no idea what he was saying, but he was screaming in some sort of language, and I remember my Uncle Sylvan and my Uncle Sam, who were sitting in the same room, would say, Papa, Papa, it's all phony, it's all fake, no one's getting hurt, Papa. But apparently, these remarks did not cut to the heart of grandfather's complaint. And, and as far as I remember, he sat in that rocker and just yelled at the set. Yeah. It was beautiful. Uh, we had a, we didn't go to Shabbat, uh, Saturday school. We went to Sunday school back then because we were reform. We went to Temple Emmanuel. And Sundays after Sunday school, after Temple Emmanuel, we went over and the beginning of the, the the afternoon festivities was I ran in to see grandmother. And grandma was always in the kitchen manning the pots and pans. And she always had one pot of lima beans going and one pot of chicken soup or something going. The smells you could grab. It was so delicious. And grandmother always used to play a game with me. Uh, she had these vanilla cookies she kept in a jar in the closet. And I had to guess which hand she held the cookie in. Let's see, she cheated. She had a cookie in both hands. Oh, siblings. Siblings. My brother Paul. Okay, so he's just the one brother. My sister Barbie. Oh. I was in the middle. And my brother Paul, you could not have had a better big brother. He uh, was a teacher to us. He was a protector to us. And he kind of created the narration of our early lives. What was it that you and your brother and sister would do that you would die if your parents ever knew you were doing it? Well, the main thing we did that my parents never knew we did. Now, this is just me. Okay. Uh, I was a secret member of the Dangerous Animals Club, which uh, Billy Hart, who lived across the alley in Oak Cliff, and me were kind of the only two active members. Charlie Harp, who lived down the alley, also wanted to be a member. And Mark Dombrowski, who lived down the road, also said he wanted to be a member, but they really didn't come on many of the excursions. Billy Hart and I made a list of every horrible, deadly thing in the state of Texas, and there are tons of them. Rattlesnake, copperhead, corals, coral snake is deadly. Uh, Water moxen, tarantula, black widow, spiders, scorpions, centipedes, the worst. So what I would do is I'd be home. I'd go, Mom, um, I think I'm going to go out and play with Billy Hart. And she says, OK, honey, have a good time. Bye. And I'd go out, and we would go out, and we would hunt water moccasins. And, uh, and it's one thing to hunt a water moccasin. It's a completely different thing when you catch a water moccasin. And once we caught a water moccasin. And I reached down into the grass to grab a baby water moccasin. And I guess it crawled 
under its mother or something like that in a protective mechanism. I didn't see the mother. I reached down and I ended up picking up a four foot water moccasin, not safely behind the head as they do on Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I grabbed around the fat middle of her body and she looked back at me and opened her mouth with these huge fangs and I was trying to bite at me and so I start, started swinging the water moccasin around my head and crying. And I said to Billy Hart, what do I do now? And Billy Hart says, well, not much because water moccasins will track you. They'll track you, they'll track you where you live. Uh, I said, but what if we run fast? It doesn't matter. She'll track you by scent. It could take days, but she'll find you. And so I ended up helicoptering the water moccasin back into Cripple Creek and I ran home all the way crying, ran in, sat at the table. Mom gave me dinner and says, did you have a good time playing with Billy Hart? Yeah, Mom, yeah. Um, do you lock the doors at night? She goes, yes, Stephen, yes. Thank goodness. Did the, did the water moccasin never make it home? Never made it. Never made it. So never made it. I assume it was just one of those fabrications that seven-year-old boys make. Where'd you go to grammar school? Oh, grammar school. What is that word grammar? Do we even use that anymore? I, I went to kindergarten at Williamson School, but I don't think we learned grammar. The only thing I remember about Williamson School was we had a cookie break. And I think the rest of the time we just chased each other. And then after that we went to Jeff Davis Elementary School before it was Barbara Cartland elementary. Uh, Jeff Davis, it was in Oak Cliff, that was through first through fourth grade. And then after that I went to John W. Carpenter Elementary School, fifth through seventh grade. Do you remember any teachers? Did any teachers have a bearing on you? Oh, I remember a ton of teachers. I remember a lot. Uh, there was Maddie Lee Smith, who was my first grade teacher. Uh, I was so proud to go to school in first grade. I felt like I was a real grown up. And I made straight ones. I don't know if they still have that designation here in Dallas. Or do you do the A, B, C, D, F system? Yeah, well, back in the old days, we had one through four. And one was good. That meant you were making rapid progress. Four meant you were an absolute failure. But in Maddie Lee Smith's class, I made straight ones in the one moment that of great difficulty that brought me shame was I had to go potty in her class and I was embarrassed to raise my hand to say I had to go potty because the bathroom was in the cloakroom at the back of the class and I ended up peeing in my pants which created an unscheduled trip of mom coming to school with an extra pair of pants. But that was the only stain on my career in first grade. I don't think you raised your hand from that point. I, uh, I drank less water at school. <laughs> uh, second grade left a mark on me, Miss Cooper. That left a mark on me. That's too long of a story, I think, for this. Uh, needless to say, uh, I didn't have a good time in Miss Cooper's class. And from that point on, I fell off the cliff of scholarship. <laughs> I was no longer a good student in second grade. Third grade, Miss Murphy, even worse. Fourth grade, I felt like I'm going to be one of the guys who smokes cigarettes behind the wood shop. I was not a good student at all. And miraculously, we had to switch schools to Carpenter. And in fifth grade and sixth grade with Miss Middleton, she believed in me and I believed in her and I began to be a good student again. Wow, it's, am it's amazing you remember all their names. Oh, I do. Yeah. Seventh grade Miss Gardner is when Kennedy was shot. And I still remember the amazing events of that day. We were, I was out on the playground and uh, a boy I was playing with saying like, I hope they kill him. And I go, why? And they said, because he's a nepotist. And I thought, wow, a new insult. I had never heard that word before. And I was going, what's a nepotist? And they said, well, that's when you give jobs to people who are in your family. And then I was thinking, oh, no, my Uncle Jaime is a nepotist. You know, Uncle Jaime had, gave me a job working at EM Cans downtown when I was 14 years old uh, here. 
then some kids with a transistor radio were saying, the president's been shot, the president's been shot. And I said to the kid next to me, do you think he's going to be all right? And he said, oh sure, somebody just did it to scare him. Like we lived in a world where we thought it was going to be okay to be shot. We went up to our homeroom class and Mr. Moffat, our principal, announced that John Kennedy, the President of the United States, was shot and killed in Dallas 12, around 12 o'clock in the afternoon. And a girl in our class stood up and screamed and ran out of the classroom and nobody moved to stop her. And Mr. Moffa continued with saying, we'll now bow our heads for two minutes of silence in honor of President Kennedy. And you could still hear the girl screaming, running down the hallway. It was such a haunting moment. Mm -hmm. uh, that was seventh grade. What was, the, what was it like for your family when you came home that day? I don't remember anything odd in our family except we sort of sat around the TV and watched the news. Right. And I remember the next day they had the biggest headline I ever saw in my life. And none of it was real until, I mean it was not real at all, until that second afternoon when they had, it took a long time for news to get on TV. Right. I mean, it, right. they filmed it all. And when they had pictures of all the places I knew, there was the Texas School Book Depository where my mom bought me school books. And down the road was E.M. Cans where my uncle Jaime had his store mm -hmm. uh, right by the Triple Underpass. And there was the Texas Theater where they caught Lee Harvey Oswald where I always went to kid matinees on Saturdays. So once I saw all of these places I knew, it all came home. Yeah. Tell me about your parents. Mm. My dad, Dave Tobolowski, a doctor, family doctor, worked harder than anyone I ever knew and have ever known since. Uh, dad was a family doctor in Oak Cliff and he made house calls, which meant he was on call all the time. Uh, middle of the night, it, there, there was no time off for dad. He, he was always, and this was of course before the age of cell phones. So he was always hanging around the phone or uh, anywhere we went he had to go to a payphone, f find something that was close. My mother, uh, probably in my life the kindest person I've ever met, still to this day. Uh, remarkable, idiosyncratic, nutty, I, I still think of things mom said and did and, and it's just hilarious and hilarious the things she put up with. My brother and I, uh, my brother used to invent games as I said that we uh, used to play together. One of the games he invented was indoor golf. Indoor golf. And we played this with real golf balls and golf clubs. Well my mother was, you know, please the furniture, please the walls. <laughs> I mean, we were hitting a three iron from the living room. And, and it was basically a putting game. And uh, when my sister was out of the house, my, uh, my brother took my sister's favorite doll, appropriately named Dolly, and put it out as a sand trap. And uh, I hit the ball into the sand trap and accidentally beheaded Dolly with a pitching wedge just as my sister came in from playing outside oh, and the screaming and crying. And my mother, bless her soul, she got masking tape because she said it was flesh colored. And she said, Barbie, honey, we're gonna fix Dolly right now. And she got Dolly's head and started wrapping it up with masking tape and said, see, good as new. And Barbie saw Dolly with her head kind of like this with the masking tape and began screaming again. And mom, mom was always there to make lemonade yeah. out of the lemons. Yeah. High school life. Oh dear. Where, where did you go to high school? I went to high school at Justin F. Kimball. Uh, I had a primary event in my life in that I got sick when I was around my 13th birthday. 
and I was sick for like two years. And I couldn't, I couldn't do sports really. I couldn't go to gym. And uh, I hadn't, it was great. Because I got notes that, that I get out of gym and got to go to study hall. Hey, got to go to study it. That was probably added to me becoming a better student. And also missing gym was always good. Uh, but I missed gym, but it was in the study halls that I began reading plays more. And I began being interested in other vent avenues for my energy. And so when I went to high school, I saw a couple seniors, they were recruiting for the debating team, and in our history class they did a practice debate after school. And I came and I saw that and I said, this is what I want to do the rest of my life. I want to be a professional debater. Uh, it's not a really good job occupation. Uh, so I began in high school studying debate and speech. And from debate and speech, our debate and speech teacher was the same as our drama teacher. And someone dropped out of a school play in 10th grade called A Different Drummer was the play. And because I was good on the debate team, Miss Mary Curtis, uh, now Mary Forrest, uh, said, Stephen, would you like to be in our play? And that was kind of the first play. I mean, I always did plays as a kid, but this was one of the formative plays that made me think maybe I wanted to be an actor. And at the end of 10th grade, I had the lead in the one act play, which was in competition. So it was a competition thing and we won our district and we went to state. And at the state finals, I won the award, well it's not really an award, is it? Uh, I won honorable mention for, for playing Arpegon, a 60-year-old man in the miser, but you could say I was kind of bitten with the acting bug. So from then on in high school, I concentrated on debate and acting in plays. After high school, you know, a turbulent time in the country. Vietnam War was raging. You know, what, what were you thinking? What's going on in your head? We were traditionalists, us Tobolowskis. We, we believed in, you know, our government and our country and our war and everything was right. And then Vietnam happened and I knew if they called my number, I would be dressing up like a woman crossing the Canadian border, just like that. And mom said, Stephen, you're not going to that war. I will take you to Canada myself. You will not go to that war. I remember being a freshman in college, and it was around that time, either freshman or sophomore year in college, I'm thinking maybe sophomore year, where they were gonna call off student deferments. Because student deferments weren't fair. What ended up happening is, all the people who didn't have the money to go to college, even though college was not nearly as expensive as it is now, uh, but basically your poor farm boys and people who lived in the country ended up going to fight and people who could go study drama at SMU got a student deferment. Well, they were gonna call that off and everyone was given a number and my number, there were three batches of numbers. Whoever was in the first batch was going to Vietnam. Who was ever in the third batch was not going to Vietnam. And whoever was in the second batch may or may not go to Vietnam, depending on how long the war went on. I was at the top of the second batch. And it's interesting. We, we always like to think of life as being composed of the decisions we make. But so much of life is composed of the times when no decision can be made. Mm -hmm. When either you don't have the information, the power is not in your hands, uh, you are living at a particular time in history, dot, 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 where you cannot be master of your life. And this was me in college. I was at this period where I didn't know if I was 
going to live through my college era if I would be shipped to Vietnam. And it was horrifying. It was terrifying. And I think it made me do what happened to a lot of young men my age. I fell in love. I went to the love. I didn't go to the drug, the drug era. You know, a lot of people my age went to drugs to handle the not knowing what to do with their life. I went to the love era and I fell in love with a girl who was a year younger than me in college. And we were together for many years after that, like 16 years we had a relationship. But that was my drug of choice uh, to escape the terror of indecision. Now SMU is where you went to school? Yes. When you graduate from SMU, what are you going to do? Uh, probably be a bartender. Uh, you're, you're filled with all sorts of hopes and dreams when you're getting a degree in the fine arts. And then you realize that you are just walking a real long plank off of a pirate ship. Uh, we had some people who wonderful actors who ended up working in a shoe factory, some who worked for their father's air conditioning company, some sold real estate, some sold socks. I ended up going back to school. That's another option. I went to graduate school at the University of Illinois in drama and made the plank on the pirate ship that much longer. Two more, another year longer. Yeah, yeah. Where, where was the turning point for you? Boy, where do, you, where do you define a turning point? It's, where do, you, where do you find the beginning of a story? I could say maybe the turning point were some of these, was, was the fact that I couldn't get a job after SMU and had to go to graduate school. And at graduate school, I began to lose my hair, which I thought was the end of me. I thought, I'm done, I will never play a leading role in Shakespeare again. Everything I studied for was done. I'm not going to play a romantic lead. I'm 25 years old and losing my hair. I didn't know that I was, I was grooving my life to be a character actor at this point. Once you lose your hair early, you look the same for, a, especially if you have glasses and lose your hair, you can look the same for decades. Uh, it was at graduate school that my girlfriend decided she didn't want to be an actress anymore. She wanted to be a writer. And she ended up winning the Pulitzer Prize. Wow. In, uh, you know, from her, from our, our detour to Illinois. So I thought maybe the best thing in life is that you don't know what you're doing. I came out to Los Angeles after that, couldn't get a job still and began working in children's theater, doing plays about Sacagawea three times a day. It was the death of a thousand cuts. I didn't, then I thought, well, maybe I'll be a rock and roll star, except I couldn't sing or play an instrument. It was, it was, it was torture. There was, there was nothing. And I think, I think a real turning point for me was I went to the Studio Arena Theater in Buffalo to do one of my girlfriend's plays, the Miss Firecracker Contest. Her name was Beth Henley. So you left LA to go all the way back to Buffalo? Yeah. Okay. And, and at this point, I was massively depressed. Right. D E P R E S. I mean, I thought, in fact, I was so depressed, people didn't want to be around me. So the only thing I could do was get a job for my girlfriend. I went back to Buffalo and I did a Del Monte and the Miss Firecracker contest. And the lead in our show, uh, uh, Catherine Grody, she felt that she wanted her agent to come see this play because it was so good. Her agent was a big shot, Jeff Hunter, who came from Manhattan to Buffalo to see the show. He saw the show on a Sunday matinee, Monday afternoon, I get a call from New York, Jeff Hunter, and says, Stephen, this is Jeff Hunter. You have an agent? I said, no, sir. He says, you do now. He says, uh, can you come into the city? I said, well, Monday's my day. He says, come into the city next Monday. I'll take care of you. I drive 
in from Buffalo to Manhattan, which is not a short journey. I went in to see him. He sat down. Within a matter of a few minutes, he said, do you need a place to stay? Do you need money? Do you need a job? He set me up with about 18 interviews. He called up his uh, associates in Los Angeles and says, I have a new client, Stephen Tobolowsky. He's going to be your client now. Jeff Hunter moved me from being an actor who was completely unknown to being in a good agency. I had a mantra when I was a student, and that was get a job, get an agent, get a good job, get a good agent. Now, I jumped to the head of the class. I had a good agent. Now I was more likely to get a good job. Uh, I was on Broadway in 2002, and I was nominated for a Tony Award. When people say they were nominated for a Tony Award, that means they didn't win. That's what we say when we lost. So I was nominated for a Tony Award, and Annie, my wife, and I went to the Tony party, and there was Jeff Hunter, who I had not seen since, I only saw him that one time in the office. That one time in the office when he set me up with those auditions, and then I was back in Los Angeles with all of his associates. Never saw him the rest of my life until 2002. So I did that play to give you a time frame. I did the Miss Firecracker contest in Buffalo about 1981. Didn't see Jeff until 2002. That sounds like 21 years to me. I saw Jeff Hansen, not, not, not Jeff, Jeff Hunter. Jeff Hansen's another important man in my life. Boy, they're all named Jeff. Wow, I'm sensing a trend. Uh, so I see Jeff Hunter at the Tony party. And I came up to him, I said, Mr. Hunter, you made such a difference to me in my life. Uh, I would not have had the career I had today. Nothing would have happened for me. I wouldn't have been in this play if it hadn't have been for you helping me out. He goes, who are you? <laughs> he had no idea who I was. Oh my gosh. So for him, it was like manna from heaven, an absolute stranger coming up and saying, you mattered to me in my life. Yeah. Uh, so that was a big turning point. Jeff Hunter uh, got me a good agent, and from then on, I was being sent out on real jobs in TV and real jobs in movies. Yeah. Yeah. What do you prefer, television, movies, or stage? Oh, well, movies are the best for the lazy man. They give you a lot more money, and you work a lot less. Television is, there's a lot more jobs in television, so frequency of job opportunity is higher, but they work you. They work you till you drop dead. You know, everybody wonders, like, why do people who are on, like, Law and Order SVU, they're doing that great job, why do they quit? Why do all these people, qu they quit because they're 18-hour days, and you don't get a life, and you don't get to see your family. So TV is hard work, but I love it because it's frequent. There's nothing like the thrill of being in theater because it is live every night, you and the audience, and you could always go up in flames. Yeah. Nothing is a given in theater, and the risk and reward are enormous. Yeah. So often, you know, you know, people not in the industry, we hear about actors playing a particular part and then they're pigeonholed. Huh. You know, does that really happen? Yeah. Uh, the, the name of uh, Hollywood could also be shallow grave. Anytime you're successful in one thing, they're going to try to run that thing into the ground. Uh, and then they'll say, well, you're too identified with that role. When I did uh, Ned Ryerson in Groundhog Day, I got so many offers to play wacky characters right. and that kind of thing that it was you have to look for a change of venue, either by going to theater, which is where you have the greatest opportunity to play outside of your type, or uh, do something completely different. And I had the opportunity to do something like Memento, which was completely different from Groundhog Day. But it's very difficult in Hollywood because they will pigeonhole you. Uh, they are putting together packages and what would you rather do? Would you rather make 50 phone calls or three phone calls? Yeah. Simple question. People want to make three. 
So if you're looking for a part of a guy who's kind of wacky, who wears glasses and is bald, you go like, well, do we want to have an open call? Or do we just want to bring Stephen Tobolowsky in? So it's inertia, right? I think that's the right term. It's, yeah. Now for actors, being so recognizable as yourself, what is that life like around people when you go out? Is that difficult or, is, or do you enjoy it when people are coming up to you and probably talking to you about Groundhog's Day? Yeah, it's, it happens daily. Uh, most of the people who recognize me are generous and polite and kind and I don't have a lot of uh, crazy people. Uh, it's probably because of the time I'm not a star. Uh, but I could understand how it would get kind of wacky because you do have plenty of people who come up to you while you're eating dinner and going, hi, uh, I don't want to interrupt your dinner. I saw you sitting over here and I just wanted to say, and I'm going, you're interrupting my dinner. Y y you know, you just began by saying you don't. And you, you have to deal with that. Uh, but generally, the people are extremely kind and extremely generous. And they, it's just something somewhere that I did that moved them or touched them and they want their picture with me or something. So it's, it's all good. Yeah, yeah. Is there a part that you wanted that you just didn't get? There, there's a lot of vaporware in Hollywood, a lot of vaporware that happens. And when I was younger, uh, that vaporware comes down like a fish hook, like just this week. A week ago, Woody Allen called my manager and wanted me in his newest movie. And my manager called me and says, who would you want to be in a movie in more than anyone else? I go, uh, Godzilla? I don't know. So how about Woody, Woody Allen? Yeah. Then the next day they call and say, well, Woody Allen is saying, like, would you mind this part is really small? Would that insult you if the part is small? I said, are you kidding? I would do it for free. I would clean his apartment and, and do, do the film. I would love to do it no matter how small it is. And then two days ago, I get the call. Woody Allen says, it's too insulting for you to do this part. He's going to wait to use you in a part that, that will show you off more. So beginning, middle, end. The hook appears. It's there. This time I didn't bite. I just kind of went and thought, oh, well, that's interesting. And maybe I'll be in a Woody Allen movie down the line. Maybe I won't, but I'm not going to think about it. Yeah. But, but it happens all the time. Um, well, is there a movie that we've all seen that you sit at home and go, that was supposed to be my part? Uh, th there, there's something that you've all seen, but I didn't go, damn, it should have been my part. I, I should have gone, damn, if I had only known what this was. I was brought in to audition as one of the policemen in the premiere of Law and Order to play Max, the part that George Zunza ended up playing, right? He was the first cop in Law and Order, right? Mm -hmm. uh, before Lenny, right, was, was George, I'm, I'm trying to think, was Lenny Briscoe in from the beginning? I, I, but the part George Zunza played, and he only played it for like one season, and then they killed him off because of the 18-hour days. He wanted either more money or he, he wanted 15-hour days, and they go, absolutely not. But when I went in on that audition, I thought, oh, another cop show. Law and order. Oh, God. What? Haven't we seen this before? And I had, and I was reading the script not with a clear mind of thinking like, of really seeing what was on the page and what, uh, and what was being created. And uh, I went in and I think I wasn't good on that audition. But hey, you know, that was my one shot at it. I, I ended up having a guest part on Law and Order Criminal Intent and Law and Order SVU, at which were such extraordinarily delightful experiences. Yeah. And I went, and so I do occasionally kick myself saying like, oh Stephen, oh Stephen, if you had been the cop on Law and Order, what a great part for you. Hey, James Gardner once said, I saw him on TV, he goes, you know, I'm not into method acting, I'm not into really, he goes, I go there and just read the lines. Let me say something about James Gardner. You will notice that there is long lineage 
of great actors who were in the military. And you will also find a long lineage of great actors who were in athletics. Uh, Mark Harmon, uh, The Rock. But, but you have James Garner, you have Clint Eastwood, you have Lee Marvin, you have Gene Hackman. Uh, all of these people were in the military. And I, I remember I asked uh, on some of the shows wh when I was working with, I just worked with uh, Scott Glenn, who was, I think, in the Marines. And I asked Scott, I said, why is it that there's so many great, great actors like Scott Glenn from the military? And he says, Stephen, it's the discipline. It's the discipline. It's the same discipline an actor has to have. We're used to getting up early. We're used to working late. We're used to making do. We're used to dealing with problems. And we, very much like James Garner would, was said, we look at something and we just call it what it is. Mm -hmm. This is this. And we don't make any fuss about it. We just say something what it is. And there is a left aloneness that's brilliant in all of those guys. Now, I do think a lot of them, especially like Gene Hackman, they, they all went to acting school too. But they were all in the military and I think that, that was a lot to do with yeah. the fact that they're all good looking. <laughs> what was your favorite part that you played? Well, the favorite part had to be Ned and Groundhog Day. That was, that was not only, there's kind of a, uh, a formula in Hollywood that you have to be good in a good movie that people saw. Mm -hmm. If any one of those three things is missing, you chalk this one up as a disaster. Yeah. If you're good in a bad movie that everybody saw, it's the end of your career. Yeah. If you're bad in a good movie that everybody saw, it's the end of your career. But in Groundhog Day, I was good as Ned. It was a great movie and everybody saw it. It was fun to shoot. Harold Ramis was brilliant. It was wonderful working with him. It was interesting working with Bill Murray. He was one of the best actors I've ever worked with. Everybody thinks of him as a wild and crazy guy. I didn't find him wild and crazy at all. He was not fun loving, but he was a fine, fine actor. Um, that was certainly the most fun. Do you find your friends are mostly other actors? Have comedy? to be. Most, most people you end up knowing or meeting our other actors, but we don't have any friends. Yeah. We, we're friendless. We, we work too much. So tell me about Ann now. When did you meet Ann? Uh, there's a debate about that. There is a debate about when I met my Annie. Uh, one school of thought says that we met at a wake. Uh, Ann was in a movie, uh, The Doll Maker, with an actress, Susan Kingsley. And I was on Broadway in the wake of Jamie Foster with actress Susan Kingsley. Susan was one of the most brilliant actresses, brilliant spirits on earth. 33 years old, killed by a drunk driver, mother of two. Uh, I heard the news in New York when we had just closed our play and Susan went back to Kentucky, I think where she lived, on a tobacco farm. We heard the news and went to a memorial service in New York. And then our play was done and I flew back to Los Angeles and there was a memorial service in Los Angeles. And that's where I ran into this girl that just I thought was this cute Hollywood actress, not knowing that I was about to meet about the most interesting person in the world. And um, that's one school of thought that that's where I met Anne Hearn. The other school of thought was that I met Anne Hearn yelling at her at a box office uh, working for uh, the Ensemble uh, Studio Theater in Los Angeles that the box office person was telling me I couldn't get in without a ticket and I was saying I was the goddamn director and I get in without a ticket. I don't need a ticket. And I started yelling at this girl and made the girl cry. Now, one of them was either Anne, both could have been Anne. As it was, uh, Anne ended up, I'm going to tell this story. I'm going to tell this story. Uh, the audition story. 
Is that okay? Sure. Okay. So um, I was directing a play at a, <coughs> at a theater outside of Los Angeles, uh, South Coast Repertory. And I had just finished directing a play in New York wh where I worked with Holly Hunter and I just worked with Amanda Plummer and I was trying to get one of them to play the female lead in this play. And they were unavailable. And the people at the theater said, well, you have to get this Ann Hearn in. So Ann came in and auditioned for this play. And it was one of the most awful auditions I ever saw in my life. I couldn't even believe it. Ann had a baseball cap she had over her head. And she put her knees up to where I could just barely see part of her eyes. And she was reading this monologue from the play. And she left afterwards, and I said, guys, guys, come on. And they said, you have to call her back. That was a bad audition, but she's brilliant. You have to call her back. Please. She came back, called back, terrible audition, horrible audition. I said, I cannot cast this girl. I cannot cast this girl. And they said, you have to. You, you, as a man and as a director, you are going to want to cast this person. She's a great actress. I said, what has she ever done? And they said, well, she was in this play. And, and uh, it was uh, Da, no, it was uh, A Life, a life. Uh, Hugh Leonard's A Life. And I saw that play. And I said, well, who was she in A Life? And they mentioned the part. I said, oh, well, she was the best person in the play. She was brilliant. I cast Anne in the play. Not only was she a star the bedrock of the play. She took moments that couldn't work and made them work. She, could, she got every laugh in the play. She broke people's heart in a second. She was brilliant. She was so good. I was, I was cast as Tusenbach in Three Sisters for the opening of the Los Angeles Theater Center. Big deal. And Elizabeth McGovern dropped out of the show. Uh, the director and the producer of that came to see our production, and they saw Anne in the production, and they wanted her to maybe replace Elizabeth McGovern. And Anne went over and gave a terrible audition. <laughs> and I said, she's fabulous. And they saw her performance, and they cast her as Irina, one of the absolute f biggest parts in Chekhov. Female lead, she was a star. She was a star. She was a star. She was like light on the stage, the greatest actress I ever saw. And, and she's up there with Susan Kingsley. And so I knew Anne as an actress for a couple years after that. And then one night I was at a party, and it was too loud, and it was too raucous. And I went out to the tomato garden to sit alone. And Anne walked out there, too, to sit alone. And she said, how are your tomatoes doing? And a cloud moved from behind the, and the moon beams came and hit her face a certain way. And I'm thinking like, damn, she looks good. I miss this. I miss this. And at that point, I felt romantically inclined toward the lady who a couple years later would become my wife. Now you guys have two children together? Two children together. Your kids have a normal life? No. There is no such thing as normal, uh, unless it includes playing video games nonstop and <laughs> having the same absolute doubts and stresses about having no future. Yeah. That is normal. So yeah, in terms of normal, that's normal. Our, our eldest son, Robert, is majoring in organic chemistry. He's getting his doctorate in organic chemistry. And it's just saying, what the hell am I doing? I don't want to live in a lab. And Anne is always one saying, like, if you don't like it, now's the time to leave. Do what you need to do. Uh, he's not leaving. He's too good at it. And our youngest son, William, is in molecular biology at uh, University of Santa Barbara, University of California at Santa Barbara. And he wants to be a doctor. and. Uh, He's, he's a lunatic. He is, uh, he is our thrill seeker. 
He was the kid who never could read because we think he had some kind of dyslexia. And he was the kid who teachers said, you're not going to make it. And said, you're never good enough. You're always tried to hold him back. He's the kid who's now making straight A's in honors work in college. I remember one of the great moments of William. They told him he, when he was in his middle school that he was, didn't have the stuff to be an athlete. He was kind of, they kept him on the track team to be kind of fodder, cannon fodder in the group races where you need to have all the contestants you wanted. William trained on his own and when he went to high school he broke every record they had at his school for two miles, for three miles, for everything except the sprints. He was a long distance runner. He won the award as student scholar athlete of his high school. And he was applying to colleges and the counselor, it was like one of the grandest moments of my life where I went to pick him up at school and he applied for colleges and the counselor saying like, you, you don't have the, the necessary requirements to get in these schools. You'll never get in these schools. And as we're leaving the office, William turned and said, it's not your job to tell me what I can't do. People have told me my whole life, this is what I can't do and this is what I can't do. Your job is to do what I tell you to do. And your job now is to apply to these colleges. If I don't get in, I don't get in. But that's not your job. And William got in to the University of California at Santa Barbara, where, and he runs a four and a half minute mile. And he has, instead of going to his graduation in high school, he climbed to the base camp of Everest. And instead of going, taking winter vacation, he went to Honduras and built a children's hospital and worked on latrines for villages in the jungle. And another vacation, he went to Israel uh, with a group there with um, Birthright Israel. I've never seen anyone so driven. Uh, except dri you. Except me. He is driven to achievement. And my older son, Robert, is just brilliant. He just fell into it. Yeah, yeah. He, he's just brilliant. Your lifetime, greatest invention that came along. Something, what came along that you went, how did I ever get along without this? Well, the greatest invention was before my life, which is indoor plumbing. But <laughs> in my life, the greatest invention probably, God, I have to say, first of all, the internet. That is, that's been a key for, for so much. When I think what it used to be doing research on something and what it is now, of course now there's just all sorts of fibs and fabrications that you have to clear through on the internet. But the world is so much smaller because of the internet. Uh, it's made a huge difference. Uh, another Another thing that I'm beholden to was not in my lifetime was I tip my hat to antibiotics. Been vital in my particular life. I've needed antibiotics quite often. Uh, open heart surgery saved my life. Uh, that was an important uh, development, having uh, the assembly line version of open heart surgery instead of like the medieval version of open heart surgery. Um, that's probably the inventions that come to my life that were so vital. What was the happiest time in your life? Right now is the number one that comes up because I'm living with an amazing person. Uh, I feel so blessed that I got to spend so much time with Anne. And uh, that was a great happy time in my life. Happy time with the birth of my two children. It's a cliche, but it's a cliche because it's true. When those little babies cry, you do feel it's happy. Yeah, yeah. Now in your lifetime, you've lived through so many momentous occasions. You touched on the Kennedy assassination, the turbulent 60s, um, of course the moon landing in 69, something good. 
Martin Luther King assassination. Was there something else in your life that really stood out that you said, oh my gosh, I know exactly where I was the day that happened? God, there's so many days like that in my life. Historical days, I was in Memphis when Martin Luther King was assassinated. I was there for the riots when he assassinated, when he was assassinated. It was a horrible day. Um, I remember where I was. There's so many days in my life I remember where I was, but they're not historical days. As I've gotten older, I'll, I'll mention this. When I was younger, when I was in my 20s, I thought all those historical days mattered and the days of my life were less significant. As I've gotten older in my 60s now, I think the days of my life are significant and I see the passing players as the ones who are on the national stage. The stars, the politicians, the generals, they're the nothings. And, and the, like four days ago in Los Angeles, a wildflower bloomed in my backyard that I had not seen since I was a child in Oak Cliff. Well, I saw it one other time in Dallas, but it was the only time I saw it was in Dallas when I was a boy, and I picked that flower to be a bouquet for my mother when I was five, and it grew up in my backyard in, in Los Angeles, and I was so extraordinarily happy that it tied together that moment when I was five when I first saw it, when I was 40, when I saw that flower for the second time, and now when I saw it for the third time. Those moments have grown in importance, whereas what the people in Washington do, I could care less. What advice do you have for the next generation? Right now, my mantra, and it's impossible, but my mantra for the next generation is twofold. Be less afraid because the things you're afraid of will work themselves out. The things that you think are failures are where you're going to find your greatest gifts. Like me going to Illinois, I thought that was a huge failure. Me losing my hair, I thought it was the end of my life, it turned out to be the greatest blessing. We, we are very poor uh, indicators of where blessing and curse are. So don't be so afraid. The things that are that feel like bad times could actually be your good times. And the other mantra is, have manners. Have good manners. Uh, a quotation that my wife found just recently from George Eliot and Adam Bede. Uh, when death, the great reconciler, comes, we don't regret our moments of kindness. We regret our moments of harshness. And be kind when you can, uh, because uh, there is no half-life on regret. It goes on and on and on. So be as kind as you can. Behave, have manners if you can. Uh, those two things. Thanks for doing this today. My pleasure. It was great.